Well, the case against Ripple by the United States SEC started two and a half years ago, so it's certainly been a bit frustrating and slow, but the good news is we're at the end of that journey. And while others in the crypto industry might be the beginning of that journey, I, the silver lining for Ripple has been that it's, we're kind of at the end. Sometime, I would say, to the next two and let's say six months, I expect a resolution. Uh, the judge has, the judge of the United States has been fully briefed. She has a decision on her plate. Uh, a federal judge can operate on whatever timeline she would, in this case, she would like. Uh, but I'm optimistic we're going to see resolution, I, I believe, before the end of Q3. Crypto is here. It's no longer an idea or on the horizon. It's already the reality of how businesses and people trade, move, and manage value. But despite a growing desire by businesses to engage in crypto, integrating digital asset solutions is complex. It often requires cumbersome integrations, has high costs, and involves engaging with fragmented, slow, and costly fiat payout landscape. At Ripple, we built Liquidity Hub to seamlessly bridge the new world of digital assets with the traditional world of fiat. The experience is plug and play, encompassing a single API connection into a breadth of liquidity pools. It offers optimized pricing via smart order routing and through Ripple's suite of products, best in class last mile fiat payouts into global jurisdictions will be available. Liquidity Hub powers interoperability between crypto and fiat systems, bridging digital assets seamlessly. Partner with Ripple for your crypto liquidity needs today. So what's your message to the SEC chair as you sit here in the UAE and in Dubai announcing an expansion of your business to this region, given the state of regulation in the United States right now? Who? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, so look, uh, I we were talking about this a little bit earlier. I find it as a, a U.S. a company that started in the United States and as someone who's a U.S. citizen, it's sad. Like I have sadness about this. The U U.S. is getting past not just a little bit, but by a lot. And you know, but the tough thing about this is you have a country that I think has put politics ahead of policy, and you know that's not a good decision if you're trying to invest in the economy. You're seeing, you know, certainly here in the UAE with Vara, the Visual Asset, or sorry, excuse me, Virtual Asset Regulatory Authority. Certainly, what's happened recently in Europe with Mika, uh, the United States is definitely stuck. And you know, Ripple, the, the the case with the SEC, we will spend the first time I've shared this publicly. By the time it's said and done, we will have spent two hundred million dollars defending ourselves against a lawsuit, which. From its very beginning, people were like, this doesn't make a lot of sense. You have video footage of the chair of the SEC as a professor at MIT saying 75% of these digital assets are commodities. And now he says they're all securities because he's the head of the SEC and he's seeking power. and He's putting power ahead of sound policy to grow an economy in the United States. Blockchain technologies are being invested in and pursued in the entrepreneurship outside the United States. And one of the first pieces of advice I give entrepreneurs when they come and ask me have getting something started, I'll say, if I were you, I would not start in the United States. And I think there's a lot of US based companies and even US public companies that would agree with that. Is XRP moving to retail? Guys, I think it's time we strap in because that bullish move we've been talking about could be just around the corner. And for those of us who never bought into XRP, well, you could already be too late. Anyway, let's get into today's video. As always, welcome to Money Side, your favorite crypto channel. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. That way you get updates when we drop new videos. Don't forget to smash that like button and you can always leave a comment or a question in that section below. Today, I have some interesting news that I'm sure is going to turn heads. Here's a tweet by Metal Lawman, which states, breaking, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has just filed a brief in the Coinbase versus SEC case calling out the SEC for acting unlawfully in the digital asset space. This is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, not the Chamber of Digital Commerce. This is a big deal. Here's why. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is a highly influential organization representing companies in all industries across the U.S., not just crypto. The brief opens with, as it stands today, nobody knows for certain which digital assets 
if any, are securities under federal law. Exactly. The chamber makes three arguments. Regulatory uncertainty is killing innovation in the U.S. Two, the SEC is destabilizing the digital assets regulatory environment. Three, the SEC is violating constitutional due process and fair notice rights. And the topper is four. The chamber declares the SEC's actions are not just harmful policy, they are unlawful. By the bottom line, the court will give these arguments advanced by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce serious attention. And the largest, most influential business organization in the U.S. has just declared it stands with crypto. Guys, this is it. The moment that we've all been waiting for. The U.S. government just took crypto's side. What a time to be alive! So, if you were not sure that Ripple was going to win the case, here's the proof. There is no way that the SEC is going to fight the U.S. government and crypto just to pursue their own selfish interests. I think it's high time Gary Gensler to come clean and say that he has stifled innovation, especially when it comes to digital assets, because he's a puppet for some big whale. Yeah, I said that with competence, because I believe there is someone that's bankrolling Gary. That's why he can't affirmatively say the reasons why he went after Ripple. I personally would liken Chair Gensler's approach to my son Sam's approach. He's two uh, when it comes to toys. He wants to hold all the toys, but he doesn't want anyone else to be able to play with the toys at the same time. And so I, I thank you for your answer. With North America coming in and then close third is actually Africa. So we've got 54 countries sitting in Africa, right? Whilst Mika may be awesome in the EU and regulations coming up in North America, we actually need something fit for purpose in Africa. And that's what we at Yellow Card are actually trying to build that rails and network within Africa because it's a very different use case. The utility of cryptocurrency, uh, virtual assets is very, very different uh, in Africa. How do you see that playing out day to day, Andrew, in your world? Yeah, and I think that's a very important point. You know, this is a very global industry. It's not just the US, even if it maybe started there 10 years ago or so. Um, and I would echo a lot of what uh, Cedric just said, particularly around uh, the problems of regulation by enforcement compared to what I was talking about earlier, a comprehensive, clear regime that you can build on. Um, uh, and I, again, would echo a lot of uh, Angela's points around that. Um, I mean, to your point specifically um, on Africa and its its adoption of, of, of crypto, I mean, I think, I mean, this is fairly obvious and it goes to what Ian was saying earlier. Um, the important thing is for each government or authority to decide what objectives, what policy objectives it has for the crypto sector in its own country. You know, it could be, for example, improving remittance flows, which is something, you know, as I said, that Ripple helps with, uh, or it could be to drive financial inclusion or to enhance and grow the domestic financial sector. Um, ultimately leading to economic growth. I mean, of course, you can have multiple objectives too. Um, once that's decided, then you decide how to regulate it and what the robust or comprehensive regulatory regime should look like to allow this to happen. Um, so in, for us in Ripple, given the nature of our business, cross-border payments, of course, um, the interesting for us, the interesting uh, aspect of, of crypto usage in Africa is, is the payments use case. Um, we have a product called on-demand liquidity, ODL, I don't know if uh, any of the audience saw, saw my colleague Brooks speaking yesterday. Um, you know, we're, we're excited about the opportunities this presents for the continent. We've got a partnership with MSF, MFS Africa, sorry, um, which we're using to expand our presence in the region to scale our business alongside local partners um, as digital payments and crypto adoption grows. And I mean, as you all know better than I do, digital payments innovation in Africa has been involving like at a really rapid rate um which is why obviously we're interested in in doing more business uh, in the region um but this is for a number of reasons right this is fast um population growth uh this is digital payments usage already this is mobile payments um and actually in crypto adoption by consumers africa's world leading um you know instead of using crypto for speculation purposes as is often used elsewhere many people in africa are turning to crypto to make peer-to-peer -peer payments and as a way to preserve wealth so this is quite an interesting set of use cases, um, all of which is doing what, as I said uh, in my introduction, um, Ripple wants to do, which is helping to move value cross borders and cross currencies where, where necessary. So Africa's a great opportunity, and it has an opportunity to be a great uh, trailblazer um, and to leapfrog the West, um, as, it, as it did earlier with, with mobile payments. Yeah, definitely agree with you. I think the 
figure, recent stats show, I think it's about 400 million adults in Africa. And I think 45% of them are actually unbanked, which means that opportunity just to bring products of value. Additionally, Ripple is moving in on Africa. And if Ripple gets to secure partnerships in Africa, well, that's going to be it. Gary Gensler, if you're not afraid of Ripple since the start of this case, now it's time to panic. Pretty soon, Ripple is going to be too big to stop and nothing will continue to hold back the value of XRP. Guys, I'm super excited for the future of XRP. And this could be the one opportunity that this crypto needs to switch fully to retail. So if you don't have any XRP in your wallet, you're going to miss out on the largest buyback ever. Clearly, there's uncertainty. People, people in good faith are trying to do securities analysis and they're not understanding how to do it. That's a problem. So apart from clearly defining when is a security not a security and not uh, pursuing people retrospectively, what are the other big gaps that you see in, in your regulatory framework? I mean, one that's been identified here is a lot of debate. We had not a very good office session on it recently is about the definition of property. And there are some gaps in, in how you define property in, in the digital space. Um, I, I wonder what gaps do you see in America? Well, I think 2022 taught us a lot of lessons around you know, the fact that crypto intermediaries have a lot of the same problems as non-crypto intermediaries. And I think, so one could argue, I mean, I think there's a lot the industry can do itself to put in some protections, to be more skeptical, to do much more introspection. But one could argue you should have a, a federal regulatory framework that covers the big crypto intermediaries. And I think that does probably require more a legislation um, to decide who should be doing that regulation. I, I would argue that looking at tokens themselves as securities is often problematic. I mean, sometimes a token carries with it an ownership interest in something, in which case it looks more like a traditional equity security or it carries with it some, some stream of payments that may make it look like a security. Even if something is so, a token is sold as part of a securities offering, it's not clear to me that the token itself would be the security. And so I think another gap is you could argue there's a need for a, a disclosure regime to address information asymmetries in the, pers in the person or group of persons who's, who's issuing a token and the people buying it. Um, there, we could put some kind of uh, disclosure regime in place to address that information asymmetry. Now, whether that is through registering with the SEC or whether that's through having um, the exchanges put in some kind of a disclosure mechanism so that the tokens they're trading, they make sure that there's disclosure that goes with them. That remains to be decided, but I would argue that's a gap. I put out a several years ago, a safe harbor, which would be designed to address that information asymmetry problem. There are different ways you could approach it, but I would argue that, that that's a gap. And there are... As always, do your own research and always trade safely, guys. Please keep in mind, we're not a licensed financial advisor. All videos on this channel are intended for entertainment purposes only. Let us know what you think in the comment section below, and let's have a conversation. Thank you, as always, for watching. Don't forget to like this video. Please click on that subscribe button below and turn on notifications so you get informed when we drop new video. We'll look forward to seeing you on the next Money Side.